As the Passover feast ended, the disciples had some time to think. It had been a rather strange few days for them. Jesus kept bringing up his death and that it was at hand so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. But rather than the usual griping from the religious leaders and the offense they took at Jesus, things didn't seem that dire. The temple guards could have arrested Jesus at any time, especially when he turned over those tables of the money changers. They could have arrested him while he was teaching in the temple, which he had done throughout the week. But no one that they knew of had made a move against Jesus. In fact, Jesus had entered the city in a celebratory parade with people shouting and welcoming him. It had been amazing. Tonight's feast itself had been a little peculiar at times. For one thing, they weren't sure what was up with Judas. He hadn't been acting like himself for a couple of days. He and Jesus had some words, and he left abruptly at the end of the meal. For another thing, Jesus had come down kind of hard on Peter, but that wasn't completely unusual. Peter was given a lot of responsibility, and Jesus expected a lot of him. During the meal, Jesus became very serious and told them to remember him when they broke bread and drank wine together. He said something odd about this would remind them of his broken body and his spilled blood for their sakes and for their salvation. It was all rather mysterious. And they couldn't imagine what he meant, but, you know, like so many of Jesus' sayings, it would probably become clear in time. They were all stuffed from the multi-course supper. And as usual, when they were in the city, Jesus led them up to the Mount of Olives. It was typical for them in the evenings. The Mount was kind of their home base. It was cool under the trees there, and there was often a light breeze blowing. They would sit together and talk, or just sit quietly, look at the stars, and think about the day that was quickly passing. It was strange that <coughs> Judas was still absent, but they figured he'd probably join them immediately. Each of the Gospel writers portray these moments a little differently. Matthew and Mark say he went to Gethsemane, and John simply wrote that he went to a garden. But Luke places the small group on the Mount of Olives. But it was clear that Jesus and the eleven disciples withdrew from the hot, crowded city to be alone. Jesus tells the disciples to use this time on the mount to pray and specifically pray that they would not come to a time of trial. It was an interesting directive. Sometimes we are critical of the disciples because they fell asleep after Jesus left them. We think, how could they fall asleep at such a moment? It's important to remember that they didn't know that this was such a moment. They were literally and figuratively in the dark. The week had been grueling, they were probably exhausted, and their bellies were full of roast lamb and fruit and wine and bread. Under less 
pressing circumstances, I've fallen asleep when I've been in prayer. But Luke actually says something more insightful. Jesus found, found them sleeping because of grief. Maybe they had thought about what Jesus said at supper and it started to come together for them. Maybe they had a feeling that things were going to change dramatically that night and there was absolutely nothing they could do about it. Grief is exhausting. And when they closed their eyes, they found some sweet and peaceful moments of sleep, <coughs> which they needed. The central theme in this part of the story is prayer. Jesus told them to pray. He withdrew from them and he prayed. He prayed that he would be spared what was to come. He didn't want to be beaten and hung on a cross. But he added a caveat to the prayer. If he can be spared his suffering, that would be wonderful. But if he can't, he was willing to go through it. If this horrible path in front of him was the only way to save people from sin and death, he was willing to walk it. His anguish over what was to come was so great that his sweat became like drops of blood. What torment Jesus felt in that olive grove. What grief and sorrow weighed him down. Darkness was all around him, choking his breath and blinding his vision, isolating him from every other human being on earth. And yet, in that moment, an angel appeared. A presence from heaven. And the angel gave him strength so that he could get up, put one foot in front of another, and face what was his to do. Luke's gospel of Jesus' saving acts is full of prayer. Jesus, God on earth, prayed a lot. Jesus prayed at his baptism. He prayed in his early ministry. He prayed before appointing the disciples, before Peter's confession, at the Mount of Transfiguration, before teaching his disciples about prayer, and while teaching his disciples. And he said that the temple was to be a house of prayer. Jesus prayed when he was dying on the cross. And when he appeared as risen Lord, he prayed over a meal and was finally recognized for who he was. Jesus prayed constantly. And there's a lesson in that. If God prays persistently, that might be something we should also do with earnestness and openness. We say to God, God, this is what I want. But more than what I want, I want what you want for me. Jesus returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. He woke them up, and again he charged them to pray that they would not enter into a time of trial. 
Twice he told them to pray this. He had prayed that this bitter cup would pass by him. And to these prayer requests, God said, no. Jesus would drink the cup and the disciples would enter a time of great trial. Just because we pray something doesn't mean it will come to pass. Genuine faith accepts what answer we receive, and genuine faith clings to God when God has a different plan. And while they were still in the olive grove, a group approached them, and leading the way was Judas, whom Jesus loved greatly. Judas knew that it was Jesus' custom to retire to the Mount of Olives, so he knew exactly where to find him. Judas, Judas walked up to Jesus and kissed him, as was the practice at that time and place. Jesus looked deep into his eyes and said, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? And Judas was absolutely silent. A scuffle then occurred between the temple guards and the disciples, and it was Jesus who said, no more of this. There stood Jesus, who only moments earlier had been on his knees, racked with despair and surrounded by darkness, taking complete control over the scene. No more of this. While the torches of the guard lit up the clearing, it was a different light that illuminated the Christ. While the power of darkness often seems to gain the upper hand, it cannot extinguish the power of light. The love of God is always in command. There are times in our own lives when we are betrayed, overwhelmed, and in despair. That kind of darkness can seem overpowering. But the light of God 